Book TV on C-SPAN 2. All books, all weekend, every weekend. Now a hearing on proposed initiatives to assist in the 2000 census. The House Census Subcommittee heard testimony today from Census Bureau Director Kenneth Pruitt and Representatives Sue Myrick and Carrie Meek. Florida Congressman Dan Miller chaired the hearing. It's two hours and 15 minutes. Good afternoon. The a quorum is present and we shall uh, begin the hearing of the subcommittee on the census. We're going to have a slight change in the order uh, this afternoon since a vote is upcoming in about another 20 minutes. And so at this time we thought we'd have the two members of Congress who will be uh, uh, testifying today make their statements and handle any questions and then we can break for a, the votes and then probably we'll reconvene, I, I would guess, right now around 3 o'clock as soon as we finish the uh, second vote. Uh, and Congresswoman Meek is on her way. And so uh, in order to expedite time, let's uh, call in Congresswoman uh, Sue Myrick. Congresswoman Myrick is uh, uh, a former mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, and was involved with the census and uh, um, is going to be able to testify today. Congresswoman Kay Granger was, uh, was also going to testify, but she's apparently sick with the flu and is not even back in town today. So um, uh, maybe on another occasion she'll ha we'll have her, uh, let, have her be, uh, be able to testify. So with that, I'd like to call on Congresswoman Sue Myrick. Well, thank you, Chairman Miller and Ranking Member. Maloney and the members of the subcommittee, I really appreciate the uh, invitation to testify today. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a former mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, and also represent the 9th District of North Carolina, so I do understand the census from both a local and a uh, regional national perspective. Um, I've got a, de a great deal of respect for the Census Bureau and the work that it does, and I have a link to them uh, on my web page, for instance. But it's out of this respect for the Bureau and the process of the Census that I come before you today um, with some grave concerns con regarding the 2000 Census. I've got serious concerns regarding the use of the sampling plan pu put forward by the uh, Census Bureau. It was difficult for me to understand all this and has been exceptionally difficult for my constituents to understand. Um, how can counting 90% of the population and estimating the rest yield accurate results? especially when the census accurately counted 98.4% of the population in 1990. I understand there were statistical experts who said it would be more accurate and those who said it would not. However, as any elected official knows, we must be able to explain the plan to the people in a way that they can understand. And for this reason alone, the Bureau's plan failed to convince my constituents that it was in their best interest to change the fundama fundamental way the census has been conducted for the last 200 years. In my years of public service, I've learned many things, but most importantly, I've learned that um, the we know better than you attitude that's so common in Washington breeds distrust and apathy. And it's amid, amid this respect of trust that I raise my first concern today. The failure of the Census Bureau to include a, a plan for post-census local review in the 2000 Census. The ability of local governments to check the work of the Census Bureau is fundamental to building trust between local and federal government. The Census Bureau has made a concerted effort to involve local governments during the planning stages to help develop maps and address lists, and it seems fundamentally flawed to cut them out from a final review at the end. I'm also keenly aware that most local government officials are in favor of the post-census local review, and why shouldn't they be? They and they alone are going to have to answer to their constituents if the problems arise from the Census, and certainly personnel at the Census Bureau are not going to answer my constituents' uh, concerns. I'm keenly aware that the Census Bureau has proposed what they term an alternative to post-census local review. This alternative is to do a two-number census and provide sampled numbers to the states for their use. The original sampling plan was difficult enough to understand, and how do I explain this need for two sets of numbers? As I understand it, population numbers for the second manipulated number will include a mixing of population data from other states. If I were a governor, how could I draw up a redistricting plan based on population data from other states? I believe that the Bureau's answer is that the states have a choice. But why waste time and money giving the states useless information? As many members of the subcommittee know, North Carolina has been tied up in court for most of the decades with redistricting disputes, and we're there again now. 
If the Bureau continues with its current plan for a two-number census, these suits will only become more prevalent. California, Indiana, Wisconsin, Virginia, Florida, New York, Illinois, and Tennessee will find themselves in similar situations. Many of the members of the subcommittee have served in local government. Is there anyone here that honestly believes that you could put forth a redistricting plan based on population data from other states and not have it challenged in court? I'd like to thank the subcommittee for the fine work you've done. The census is the foundation of our democracy, and everything that we do is based on actual enumeration in America. If the census isn't trusted by the people, then it becomes a failure. I hope the Bureau will incorporate Chairman Miller's common sense plan to count Americans. We must provide not only the Bureau, but local governments and community-based organizations with the resources and the tools they need to have an accurate 2000 census. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to share my concerns with the subcommittee. Thank you, Ms. Myrick. Uh, Congressman Meek, we've had a little change in the schedule because we're gonna have a vote shortly. We decided for, the, for your convenience actually to allow y'all to go first before we have our opening statements. So that's the reason you're immediately put in the chair to make your presentation. So we'll be able to have, ask you to make your presentation and then we'll have a chance for some questions before we proceed to vote. Uh, Congresswoman Meek uh, helped us uh, have a hearing on the census down in uh, Miami last uh, December and I uh, thank you very much and the day before we had the opportunity to spend touring your district and getting a better mm -hmm. feeling and understanding your district and I think it was very valuable both the trip to Phoenix uh, where we talked mainly about, uh, about the Indian uh, undercount problem and then Miami the unique problems of Miami uh, it was very enlightening for both Congresswoman um, Maloney and myself. So we're glad uh, that we are co-sponsoring uh, a bill that I think you're going to talk about today and uh, look forward to your comments. Congresswoman Meek. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here and I want to thank you for taking this opportunity to mark up uh, uh, 633 on uh, the Improvement Act of 1999. As you know, this uh, legislation was introduced last year and I'm so happy that we're able to bring it up this year. Now I must say to the subcommittee, it doesn't, it's good to have a good bill, but it's even better if you have the chairman as a co-sponsor of the bill. So I'm more than pleased to be here. There's techniques, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee can be used to improve the accuracy of the physical count in the 2000 census, particularly in 2000 uh, in the year 2000 and particularly in poor neighborhoods I don't think I can embellish or enhance too much more than each of you has said and known already but thousands of additional enumerators are going to be needed and will be hired and my reason for um, sponsoring this bill and the chairperson as well is that about 683 people will be allowed um, uh, to be hired if this bill is passed. And people who are on public assistance and veterans will be able to get jobs as temporary census enumerators without losing benefits. Now, all of you understand that it makes a count more reasonable if there's someone who lives in that neighborhood or someone who knows the persons who live in there who go into count. It's a known fact that many people don't want to be counted. They don't want to be found. Many of them are in apartments in the back of other apartments. Many of them are living with people uh, that other people don't even know where they're living. So it does help to a great extent to have people from those neighborhoods, people who know these people, counting. So when they knock on the door, they don't think it's a bill collector or they don't think it's someone they know nothing about. So this bill provides temporary pay for these uh, census enumerators in the decennial census and they won't have to lose their benefits. The last time this question came up, some agencies had a policies that would allow them to go ahead and be temporary enumerators without losing their benefits. Others did not. There was really no widespread acceptance of this. Uh, even the Secretary of HHS could not say this would be a standard policy throughout their agency. So it would be very good if this committee sees fit to pass this. The, the real thing we're aiming for here is a more accurate count. We know that the accurate count will be much, the count will be improved if we have people who are in these poor and minority and immigrant communities. Mr. Chairman, in many of these communities, people come in daily. They come in by boat, they come in in some other, whatever way they come in by, they are there. 
according to our constitutional mandate, we have to count every head. So if you have people who are in that neighborhood who are willing and able to find people and count them, everyone will be counted. I'll end by saying that is suspicious, suspicion of government. That suspicion of new people coming to your door asking who's there and giving, asking questions. So what this bill would do will allow these enumerators to be hired on a temporary basis and allow neighbors to count neighbors. Uh, we don't all agree on everything. We don't all agree on sampling and other methods and methodologies, but we do agree on one thing, that if we're able to enhance the count and make the count much more accurate, we need to be sure that we count these areas where we know the undercount has been uh, very glaring in poor and minority, minority communities. And we know this points us in the right direction. We're going to press for passage of this bill, and we're, we're certainly going to press the Census Bureau when this bill passes to engage, aggressively recruit minority in, in enumerators in these poor and minority communities. This is a fair and it's a crucial process, and I hope that the subcommittee will see fit to pass it. Thank you. Um, Councilwoman Meek, um, the, um, uh, we, we're not marking up the bill today. I, hopefully, I think we're doing it on Thursday morning. Um, but uh, uh, the criticism I've heard from uh, both people on the Ways and Means Committee and from Secretary Shalala, actually, is that we're usurping state power since we delegated all this power to the states and uh, we've talked about this but the question is well how do we justify doing this I mean I'm supportive of it but uh, uh, how do you answer the question of some of the critics of our bill that saying well, we, well why are we you know taking away state power since 1996 we gave them the state power mm -hmm. I think answer? that the states rights issue uh, is not a good issue here and that in terms of states they will be the first ones to sue you <laughs> if they don't think that you have an accurate count. Uh, history is replete uh, with states who have sued the Census Bureau and the government because they did not feel there was an accurate count. So I think one of the strongest parts of our rationale is keeping closely to an accurate count. They all, they all agree that the count is very, very important. I think it will be much better this time if we're able to get these people involved. And I think it does say something also to uh, poor people and minorities uh, that, look, we're so interested in your being counted. We're going to find you wherever you are, even though many of you may feel that we are encroaching upon you or that uh, we need you. We need to know that every citizen is there. Now, I'll tell you another thing, Mr. Chairman. The states are not going to hold back when you start issuing the money. When it comes down to issuing the money and giving them their share of the money, they aren't going to say, oh, we have states' rights this. They will be happy if you've gotten an accurate count in their community. I think that is something that each of them will be very much um, secure in if they know that they get the good count. Well, and another argument I'll make is that it's, it's a, this is a constitutional requirement to do the census. And so because it's very spe specific that we must conduct the best census possible in our Constitution, that I think in this case, we, we, you know, once every 10 years, we have a right to, uh, you know, make it possible. So I agree with you. Let me ask Congresswoman oh, Myers a question. About, I yeah, was just yes. going to ask if I might comment on that because I also support the bill. And, you know, this is in my mind, I'm a great states' rights person, so I'm always big on states' rights. But this is like providing guidelines for the states to follow so you know that you're going to get an accurate census. And as you said, it's a constitutional matter, and that's really what's important. So I don't see this in conflict. Mm -hmm. now, you mentioned in your statement about the, uh, the lawsuits, and I've been reading about North Carolina's, I don't know if it's settled yet, but, no. you know, I mean. It's not. <laughs> not <laughs> I mean, till this the, summer. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, the lawsuit's going to happen, but, you know, with the two-number census, it's going to be, you know, more lawsuits can we can keep track of. The whole area of census law is going to be developing over this. Uh, you know, what is your comment about the issue of the lawsuits that, you know, North Carolina's, I mean, maybe the... Well, it's been a real frustration, again, because you go back to the people in the districts. I mean, they don't know what district they're in. Every, since 1992, when Mel Watts' district was established, we've had challenges every time to his district. And so we're constantly having new districts. 
and it, it's just people just throw up their hands. They don't know where they vote. They don't know who's their representative. And you know, we just help everybody out because it's so frustrating to everyone. And of course, Mel's district and my district border each other. So we're especially affected by all this. And you know, we just keep hoping it's going to stop. Uh, we believe that he's got a good district now and it doesn't need to be done again, but people challenge it. And so that's really where we're coming from. But if you have more reason for them to challenge, I mean, they challenge now with hardly any reason at all that we're going to just be tied up in court and who knows how long this will go on not only in my state but in other states as well uh -huh. um, can you imagine how two sets of numbers were tied up even more <laughs> well I mean that's a perfect reason for them to challenge it I mean you know okay so which numbers right I mean you know it's just mass confusion is all we can see and having been through this now since 1990 his district was established in 92 so it started in 90 so he had a different district in 92, 94, 96, and 98? In 90, we didn't have a new one in 96, but we do now again for the 98 election. We yeah, have another new one. How about 2000? Is it going to be challenged? Well, right now, if the Supreme Court rules this summer that it's going, it's, uh, the challenge is okay, we will have a new district in 2000 and then a new district in 2002. Okay. Um, Congress Maloney. It's crazy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, first, I, I'd like to commend both of the uh, speakers and... Um, Carrie Meek, I certainly support your bill. Building on the comments of the chairman on the hearing that was held in your district earlier, I, it was interesting to note that all of the panelists, save one, on the record came out in firm support of modern scientific methods in counting. And the, there was a cross-section of civil rights groups of Latinos, blacks, Asians, uh, elderly, youth programs, uh, well over 50, 60, almost 100 different groups from the Miami area that came out likewise in support of a modern scientific count. But I would uh, like to ask uh, Sue Myrick uh, some questions based on her testimony. It, it has been suggested that the, the post-census uh, review operation should be reinstated and you support that. While I certainly support the concept of local review, I believe that the Census Bureau's current program of pre-census local re review is more effective, efficient, and practical than a post-census review. For starters, the program's value in 1990 in terms of adding people was small in relation to the work and cost required only 4.2 percent of the 6.5 million census blocks nationwide were challenged. The uh, re-canvas of these blocks added only 124,000 people. Further, for every two housing, uh, for every housing unit that was added through the program, upwards of two units were deleted. Uh, what is your opinion of the new pre-census local review program? Well, I support that also. I think that the, the Census Bureau, in, it, in order to have the most effective census, if they consult with the local officials firsthand. You know, they can give them information as to where they know that they've got the problems, because most local officials know where the areas are that you'll have undercounts or, you know, projected undercounts, whatever it may be. People you can't identify. I mean, you know, in our, in our city, we know, I know where all the bridges are that people sleep under. So, you know, you can go to the bridges and count them um, very seriously. And um, they're regular people who are there all the time. They live there. Uh, that type of thing. And then the reason I support the post census is because, again, it's just going back for one final check and making sure you've covered all those areas before you move forward. So I, I, I don't see it as duplication. I just think that it's another mechanism. And I think most local officials would be perfectly willing to work and not hold it up to be, you know, controversial or anything, just simply as a support mechanism. Is Charlotte participating now in the pre-census local review program? Well, I will be honest with you, and I cannot answer that question. Could you find out I for will us be glad and, to find and get out back to us on what to, yes. their participation is and, and describe I can't it. imagine they are not because we've always had an active process before. In 1990, were you the mayor of Charlotte in, in that time period? Uh, and, and did you uh, participate in the post-census local review program? Um, we, I'm trying to remember just how we were involved, and I should have checked this for, before I came today, Carolyn, and give you a, an exact rundown, and I will do that. Okay, because I'd like to know. So yeah, I'd like to know uh, how many pe people were added in Charlotte's uh, 1990 census count as a result of the post-census review. We'll get that to and, you. And how much it cost Charlotte. 
And in your opinion, was the effort and cost worth it in terms of, of the federal funds that flowed into Charlotte's coffers? Right. And, and one of the things that uh, about this is that um, when we did it back in 1990, 50% of the persons added were from two cities, Detroit and Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And when the Census Bureau looked at this, this is based on their prior testimony. I understand Dr. Pruitt will be testifying later. He can uh, uh, add to this. But uh, it was my understanding, because the post-census review was not successful, and that it only added 124,000 people, they decided to work with the mayors and the local governments before mm -hmm. to get the address list, to right. check those bridges, to check those buildings, everything that you said. They thought it would be smarter and more cost effective to do this now or do it before, which is what they have done. Right. And so um, what we're talking about in, in the process that you're proposing that we now add to their plan, what does it add to it? They've already it's, done it. They've already done that particular job. I think all it adds to it is, again, just a double checking and a making sure that all those areas have been covered, that they have done the areas that were specified in the pre-check and that everything's okay before they move forward. Nothing has been forgotten. Well, I, I think that's what the pre-census local review is for. But in Oz, the red light doesn't go off. Okay. The green light goes off. So I mean, yeah. My time is up. <laughs> okay. Um, if, if I can, if Mr. Davis, I'll switch over to Mr. Waxman. May may I? May, may I ask, Mr. Chairman, since can I get to her in writing questions about oh. Charlotte pre and post? We'll get to those and answers. Back. I, I, I have a staff person we've, here who's taking. We've that requested time. information from the Census Bureau on this, and we haven't been able to get it ourselves on right. the 1990 post census local review. One so. of the problems, Ms. Maloney, is I did go back and check with my records. All my records are archived, and we can't get to them. Oh, really? And so the person who is in the office now, you know, did not know, and there was no way for me actually to check without them going back into the archives out at the university. So that's why I wasn't able to get the information for you ahead of time, because we did try. And some of this we can get from the Census Bureau, too. Mr. Waxman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both of you for your testimony today. We all share the interest in wanting an accurate census. But in 1990, we took a census. We didn't have any adjustment, which would have reflected what the uh, Bureau of the Census wants to do this time around to be sure the census is accurate. Ms. Myrick, you said that your constituents can't understand why we would do sampling or do any of these adjustments. We would just count the people, right. and that should be good enough. Now, the GAO just No, didn't I didn't say we shouldn't do adjustments. I said we should count the people. Okay, what adjustments would you make? Well, again, if you have a review that you know you're going to be reaching the people in the areas where they are living or staying even though they're not registered at addresses so you have a pretty good idea you have counted everybody then you should be okay before and as i said checking with the city people before and then again afterwards i don't see really as duplication and then when you move forward you should have a pretty good feel that you've got everybody well uh the gao said that despite all the best efforts in 1990 mm -hmm. we didn't get everybody in some places and we double counted people in other places. Well, I think that's one reason Kerry's bill is such a good idea because... Well, let, me, let me finish because mm -hmm. the GAO, we want any, any proposal that will help us get the most accurate mm -hmm. count. I'm not arguing against her bill. Mm -hmm. But the GAO uh, said that in 1990 uh, uh, there was an attempt to try to take the figures and project where there was an overcount and where there was an undercount mm -hmm. and rearrange it. Uh, they proposed to do that, uh, uh, but the uh, Secretary of Commerce refused to do it. And as a result, we have many states that have lost money they otherwise would have had over this last 10-year period. And we have some states that made more money. They received more money because they had people counted twice. They uh, indicated, GAO indicated, that uh, 27 states and the District of Columbia lost $4.5 billion dollars over the decade in federal funds due to the failure to correct the 1990 census. Now, the biggest loser was California. Uh, the next biggest was Texas. And there were six states, Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, each lost over $100 million. Uh, Florida should be of interest to our chairman. But even North Carolina, 
lost uh, money. In fact, GAO said that North Carolina lost $68,300,000. Now, aren't your constituents going to say to you, why are we losing money because uh, the census is not making sure that we can project all the people that are here to sample and then give an accurate picture of all the people that are here. There are people in your state that aren't being counted despite all the best efforts. Even with Ms. Mink's bill, they're not going to be counted. Don't you think we ought to make sure that they are all counted and that we're not duplicating uh, the number and count over counting in other states? Now, I have no problem with the fact that they should all be counted, and I, of course, can't answer for why the Secretary of Commerce would not allow an adjustment, you know, after the last census. Um, but again, I go back to the fact that if we do the best job we can in counting them now and not just estimating, um, then if there are adjustments needed, uh, if you work with the local communities, you're going to know pretty much. They pretty much have a handle on where yeah, their people I, are. I, I think uh, they do and they don't. I mean, maybe you know where the bridges are, but you don't know exactly what numbers of people are under these bridges. But there are methods for giving some sampling that can tell you the totality of the amount. The same thing as you do and Ms. Mink does and all the other politicians uh, that we do when we try to figure out what public opinion is. We don't count every single person. We get enough of a sampling, use a scientific no. method to determine the totality of the, of the population in an area. Um, Ms. Mink, don't you think we ought to have a, 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 a count all the people we can and then use all the scientific methods to make sure that we've got a uh, sampling and a projection of the total uh, population in each area? My answer is yes, Mr. Waxman, for the last four years and even before I've been a strong proponent of sampling and that I do know that I've been in one of the states and one of the fights since 1970 regarding the counts in the census and it's been very, very standard right after each census for minorities, commu minority communities to, to find out there's been an undercount. And of course, certainly if we could do sampling, I, was, I would be very, very happy, very satisfied that we would get these people, even with my bill. Uh, no matter what methodology you do here, unless you follow science and what you do, in the end you will probably come up with a less than accurate count. The Census Bureau is made up of career people who understand statistics and the best way to count the population. We ought to take their judgment as to how to do this thing. The Census Bureau was overturned by a political appointee at the, Secret at the Secretary of Commerce who I think decided that it wouldn't be in Republican Party interest to make sure they had an accurate count. And I must say that I think we're having the same thing this time around where Republicans are saying we're afraid that if you count everybody the way the Census Bureau thinks is scientifically the best way to get the most accurate uh, statistics that it may hurt Republican Party interests. Now, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it hurts a lot of people in a lot of states, including states where we have Democrats and Republicans. We have Democrats and Republicans in California, in Florida, in North Carolina, and your constituents, our constituents, want to know why they're not getting their fair share of federal dollars uh, in order to do the things that uh, the red build roads not, uh, and everything else. The red light doesn't Mr. work, the green light's off, which means the same thing. Mr. So. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank both of the Mr. Witnesses. Chairman, if I may have just a second. Poor people, the people on food stamps, the people on welfare, they don't care anything about parties. They really don't. They're concerned about what benefits they can get from government and how government can help them. When they're waiting for a house or, or something that government should be given, people who can't afford to do it, they could care very little about the ideologies that we hear in the Congress and in the public. Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me just uh, commend you. Let me commend you and Representative Meek for what I consider to be a very uh, common sense, solid piece of legislation in terms of trying to make sure that individuals who are indigenous to low-income communities have an opportunity to participate as numerators without penalty. Representative Meek, my, my question is, even if we make use of these individuals who are indeed indigenous to 
local areas and who have a greater sense of awareness of what is there. After all is said and done, um, do you think that the people still will be counted or will we have missed a, a, a considerable number of people even making use of, of indigenous people to those areas? I think the utilization of indigenous people will enhance the ability to get an accurate count. It means that common sense tells you that if you have someone who's known in that area to go in, since you're going to have a head count, you're looking for enumerators. Uh, the Constitution says you must count every head. Well, what's any more logical way of counting every head than to have someone who knows where those heads are, who can go and tap them? And I think in that particular realm, that one of your better methods, this does not exclude now any scientific sampling that you may be able to do. But this does mean that your enumeration will be much better than it would be if you did not have them. Is it your experience that in many such areas that there are still persons who could be termed unreachable, untouchable, and that no matter how hard you try in terms of the actuality of seeking them out, that there still is a strong possibility that you're going to miss them? I don't think there's a strong possibility. I think there is a possibility, but it's not as strong as it would be if you were not to use enumerators from those areas and that they know where the people are. I visit a lot of the homeless shelters uh, in my district and those without. And if, if it were not someone that we would enlist from Catholic Charities or from some of the rescue missions who know where those people are, the regular enumerators would never find them. Or if you were to go to in a housing project, you will find out that there are many people there. You never know are there, but you will find them if you use people who live in that particular housing project, in that particular unit. And that happens a lot with children and that many times they don't get to, to an accurate count with children. You'll get a better accurate count with children. If you're working through the local CAAs, you're working through the local Head Start programs, oh, I, and to answer your question that I guess anything that exists in any amount can be measured. If that's the case then, we should use the best methodologies we can find to measure them. Thank you. Representative Myrick, um, I agree with you that there is a certain amount of confusion that will in fact exist, especially if we've got two sets of numbers in any kind of way. That, of course, some people are going to be confused even if there's only one. True. But, but with two sets of numbers, and especially the way that we're talking about using those now, and I, and, and I guess we're talking about using one set for one purpose, that is, the purpose of an entitlement, another set for apportionment. Do you think if, if, if one had to weigh or try and determine if one part of this equation was more important than the other? I mean, is entitlement more important than representation, or could you see both being equally important? I think both are equally important, and, and my main concern was simply with the fact of the confusion in, first of all, having the two numbers, and then secondly, if there are estimates from other states used, then that just gives people an opportunity to sue. And a lot of people today don't need an opportunity. They do it anyway. As for instance, in North Carolina, as I said, with our districts, you know, we thought we had done a very fair job of redistricting this last time. But they came back and said, no, it's not. So it's just that that's the concern that I have is what happens with the people at home when they are trying to figure all this out. Well, I certainly appreciate your, your response. And, you know, I just think it's unfortunate, and I feel very strongly, that after all is said and done, as we are currently moving, that there are indeed people who are going to be denied either entitlement or representation. And I think that's most unfortunate because I don't believe that it's necessary that we do that. I do think it's possible that we could indeed provide the opportunity for people to both count and be counted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Let me, I just handed a note by the staff of concerning Ms. Maloney's question that uh, Charlotte, uh, Ms. Myrick, that mm -hmm. Charlotte did participate in the uh, post Local Review in 1990, um, but they did not know the outcome because the Bureau did not tell all the communities exactly what the, uh, what the impact was, and that Charlotte uh, Mecklenburg uh, is participating in uh, uh, it is supporting post census local review now. Is that that's the county? It's the two counties together, I guess. Yeah. Well, okay. Charlotte is the city, and Mecklenburg. Oh, I county. see. That's the county. So okay. They work together. Thank you. Well, we have a vote going on. We'll take a recess for. Hopefully, we can be back here right after that second vote, which would be three o'clock, three o five, or so. We'll stand a, a, in recess until then. <laughs> The subcommittee will uh, come back into session and uh, we'll begin with opening statements by the members. Good afternoon. Today we'll hear from two, uh, we have heard from two distinguished members of Congress, Sue Myrick and Carrie Meek, and we'll now hear from Dr. Kenneth Pruitt, the director of the Census Bureau. Last week, the Clinton administration, to my extreme disappointment, officially announced its plans for a two-number census. One, a legal number mandated by the Supreme Court and a second number manipulated by their controversial and unproven sampling plan and then provided to the states. This plan, when put forth by the Clinton administration, reverses six years of policy calling for a one-number census. For years, the Clinton administration has said that to provide two sets of numbers measuring the same population would cause confusion and controversy for the American people. As recently as this, as this past November, the Census Bureau said in its operational plan, quote, the Census Bureau plans to produce a one-number census estimate of the United States population in Census 2000 that will improve accuracy and eliminate confusion and controversy caused by having more than one set of census results measuring the same population, end quote. Apparently, now that the Clinton administration's plan to use population polling rather than counting, in the census has lost in two federal courts and the Supreme Court, the administration is perfectly willing to ignite controversy and cause confusion. This two-number census is a recipe for disaster and will lead down a path that will force every state and local government in America into court. While most members of Congress and the American people thought that the Supreme Court would make the final determination on how the 2000 census would be conducted, Few thought that the Clinton administration would still attempt to sidestep the high court in order to pursue its illegal sampling plan. Director Pruitt, I read with interest your comments yesterday in roll call. You said that people were getting the impression that we are headed towards two censuses, a Republican and a Democrat census. I couldn't agree more. A Republican census approved by the Supreme Court and a Democrat census that is headed towards confusion, controversy, and the courts. In the roll call article, you were very concerned about this perception, but you shouldn't be surprised. Last week, the Clinton administration reversed six years of bureau policy by advocating a two-number census, once again putting politics above, up, over good public policy. The full count in accordance with the Supreme Court must be the most accurate possible. That is why the very week of the Supreme Court's decision, I introduced the America Counts Today, or ACT initiative, at the U.S. Conference of Mayors Winter Meeting, the America Counts Today initiative is, is designed to provide the additional tools needed to improve the 2000 census. The America Counts Today initiative is only a beginning. I would hope and expect the administration will have concrete ideas as well on how to legally improve the 2000 census. I made a pledge that day and I repeat it today that if more is needed, I will support it. For some time, I have fo been focused on how to reduce the minority undercount. I began a series of field hearings throughout the country in the hardest to count areas 
to, to learn ways to count the people that have been missed in the past. These hearings were designed to solicit the input of community stakeholders on ways to improve a traditional census in their affected communities. To date, there have been field hearings in Miami and Phoenix. The America Counts Today initiative is an outgrowth of this effort. I believe we need three major community-based improvements for the 2000 census. We need to increase community awareness, increase involvement of community leaders, and reinforce community enumeration. First, I want to increase the involvement of community leaders. My top priority has been to reinstate post-census local review. That bill, H.R. 472, is an important first step to improving the 2000 census. Nobody knows better than mayors and local officials where people in their communities live. Post-census local review gives them the opportunity to review census numbers in their communities before the Bureau makes them final. This program was used in 1990 and added more than 80,000 households, but was discontinued in 2000 to the disappointment of most local government officials. Post-census local review is a common sense idea. Why shouldn't the Census Bureau be subject to a local audit of their work? Everyone makes mistakes, and we all know that the Census is a difficult and complex undertaking. If you want local governments to trust your numbers, then you must give them a reason to do so. I've also proposed establishing a matching grant program for local partnership groups and communities to provide the resources needed to conduct outreach efforts and to encourage participation in the Census in their respective neighborhoods. Community awareness is critical to a successful census. Consequently, I have proposed increasing the advertising budget from 100 to 400 million with a significant portion of the new money targeted toward the hardest to count areas of the nation. Compared to some other federal advertising programs, the $100 million total advertising effort seemed inadequate. For example, in fiscal year 1998, the federal government provided $195 million for the Partnership for Drug-Free America advertising campaign. In fact, the campaign is expected to spend over $1 billion in advertising over five years. If the census is as important as we say it is, then we must advertise it. In addition, we have proposed expanding the census in the schools program. If we can get all the schools involved, we should make every effort we can to get them involved. Additionally, we can and must increase the number of paid census partnership specialists and again, target them to work in the areas with the worst undercount. My third major initiative involves reinforcing community-based enumeration. I have proposed adding a minimum of 100,000 additional census enumerators and target them to work in the hardest to count communities. By organizing the enumerators into elite teams and focusing their efforts exclusively on reaching hard to count populations, we will have a far more accurate count in these areas. I've also proposed enlisting AmeriCorps volunteers in the census effort. Why not use this program to reduce the undercount? They can go in early and stay late to help organize the hardest to count communities and build trust and partnerships. I've already joined with Congresswoman Carrie Meek in sponsoring H.R. 683, the Decennial Census Improvement Act, which will provide waivers to welfare recipients and retired military officers who would like to count their neighborhoods but can't because of bureaucratic red tape that would cause them to lose their benefits by taking a temporary census job. Finally, I propose that we send a second census questionnaire to households and expand the languages covered. A second questionnaire gives another opportunity to those who did not respond the first time. In the dress rehearsals, this was shown to increase the response rate by almost 7 percent. That would mean that in the 2000 census, some 19 million people could be added before we send enumerators into the field. The Census Bureau should also publish a census form, their census forms in 33 languages. So no significant group misses out on being counted because they couldn't get a form in their language. The Bureau has planned to only publish forms in five languages. Let's go back to 33 and add Braille in order to give everyone a chance to be counted. These initiatives are, initiatives are both big and small, but all will help make the 2000 census a success. Above all, we need to work together, Republicans and Democrats, black, white, Asians, Hispanics, Americans, and immigrants, we all have a stake in the census. While we haven't agreed on the path to the 2000 census, we have always agreed that the destination is a complete and accurate count in 2000. I'm encouraged that since I introduced the ACT initiative, the Bureau has showed encouraging signs of adopting many of the proposals. 
such as increasing census in the schools, increasing the number of partnership specialists, and increasing the advertising program. In fact, the Bureau has now said that it is working with AmeriCorps on how they can be incorporated into this important constitutional duty. Let me say, Director Pruitt, that I don't envy your job. It is a most difficult one. I do believe that you're being pulled in two different directions. At times, from my perspective, it is difficult to tell where the professionals of the Census Bureau start and the political appointees of this Commerce Department end. I also understand the fact, understand that this fact may be largely beyond your control. However, as Census Director, you are the one who has to answer the difficult questions. I look forward to the testimony of the witness today and hearing your comments on the America Counts Today initiative as we all work to end the differential undercount in the 2000 Census. Ms. Maloney. Um, th thank you. Every uh, American counts, so we must count every American using the most modern scientific measures. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I was uh, truly surprised and I must protest uh, your statements on the quote two number census. Um, Eighteen months ago, it was the Republicans who wrote into Title 13 the requirement to have a two number census. I have a quote from the 1997 appro appropriations bill. This was the language that was put into the bill. And at the time, you spoke out against a one-number census. Do you have Mr. His, his quote from that? So quite frankly, I am uh, surprised to now hear you criticize the Census Bureau for trying to comply with the law, the law that the Republican majority wrote and the Supreme Court ruling. I, I, I say, let's let the Census Bureau do its job and keep politics out of how we count our population. And let's count every American. The Supreme Court ruled that Congress placed limitations on the Census Bureau's ability to use modern methods for better accuracy. It said congressional apportionment needed to be carried out by the old methods, and it cited a law. But the court stated that besides apportionment, which is the distribution of seats among the states, we should allow the Census Bureau to be as modern and as accurate as possible. And I would like to put into the record right now the the law, uh, Title 13, that the Republicans wrote calling for the two-number census and, and your particular quote at the time. I, we have, now you have come forward with uh, many new ideas, uh, but the time for these uh, ideas or proposals, which are just proposals, they're not laws, they're not thought out, was two years ago. And we are really past adding bells and whistles to the 2000 census. And without specific legislative proposals, it's very difficult to say what effect any of these uh, proposals would have. The only proposal that you've made specific, you rammed through the subcommittee uh, only days after it was introduced, and I'd say the ink was uh, still wet. I'm glad that you are supporting Mrs. Meek's bill. She introduced it in 1996. I um, really know that every Democrat will support her bill. I understand that Senator Moynihan plans to introduce a companion bill in the Senate. And I think her bill, and I'm glad you support it, is a very good idea. But let's be very clear. It won't do anything to truly address our biggest problem, the racial differential, and the fact that the old methods of counting will never be as accurate as modern scientific ones, no matter what we did. The most uh, glaring problem with your proposal, or all of your proposals, if they were fleshed out or if they were worked out, is that it will not address this real problem. In 1990, there were 8.4 million people missed in the census and 4.4 million people counted twice. Nearly 70% of those missed 
were in households that were counted. And for African Americans, 80% of those missed were in households that were counted. Adding housing units, as your local review bill calls for, does not address these problems. Increasing the advertising budget, studies have shown, will not help to count those who are missed and it will not eliminate the millions who are counted twice. At best, it can improve the male response rate. A grants program might raise awareness, but it's not likely to get people counted in the right place on April 1st. We've done the hard work on Representative Meek's bill. My staff and Senator Moynihan's staff have, have worked with her and with your staff. And I hope uh, that uh, you will have a markup this week and, and that uh, it will be a signal of the beginning of a bipartisan 106th Congress we've been hearing so much about. As part of that bipartisan effort, Mr. Chairman, I would urge you and your colleague, colleagues to please discontinue your attacks on the professionals at the Census Bureau. You have called the Census Bureau professionals statistical shills and more recently accused them of, quote, peddling snake oil. The Speaker has called the Census Bureau experts hypocrites. A Republican foundation funded by the Republican National Committee has gone as far as to compare the Census Bureau to the Mafia. What's next, Jerry Springer? These kinds of attacks are unprofessional and uh, they're just uh, demeaning to everyone. We can have policy dis disagreements without resorting to name calling. The opponents of a fair and accurate census decided to fight the census plan in the courts. Well, as a result of the Supreme Court decision, the Census Bureau is going to cost, uh, the census is going to cost two or three billion dollars more and be less accurate, at least for purposes of apportionment. You can't escape these sad facts by uh, attacking the professionals at the Census Bureau. I, I would like to really end by um, clarifying one point and ask that my comments in full be put in the record. Uh, the Supreme Court decision was very clear. It, it, uh, it uh, uh, touched only apportionment. It clearly stated that more accurate numbers using modern scientific counts could be used for other purposes, such as good data, distribution of funds to our localities, and redistricting within the state. And I would suggest that we should let the professionals at the Census Bureau do their job. I would suggest that most Americans would prefer that professionals conduct the census and not politicians. So I really hope that you will in a bipartisan effort, support the professionals at the Census Bureau and at the very least stop the name calling. Mr. Davis, do you have a, a very brief opening statement so you can proceed? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would want to echo some of the sentiments expressed by the ranking member. I also want to thank you for calling this hearing regarding initiatives designed to increase the accuracy of the 2000 census. I'm also pleased that you've decided to hear from the Census Bureau regarding the issue of post-census local review and the nine additional activities that you propose today to improve the accuracy of the census. First of all, let me state that no one can be opposed to ideas that seek to improve the accuracy of counting the people. However, as Census Day fast approaches, it is important that we find consensus on one plan and not duplicate efforts that are already underway. Several of the initiatives embodied in the America Counts Today proposed by you seem to be already under consideration by the Census Bureau. If that is the case, then I do not see the need for the initiatives aside from pure discussion. Nonetheless, I look forward to hearing Dr. Pruitt's comments regarding the initiatives that have been proposed. In addition, as a former city councilman and Cook County Commissioner, I can really appreciate the zeal to allow local governments a last opportunity to review census data for errors. 
After all, as a local government, the opportunity to have one last chance to increase your count is too tempting to pass up. However, based on the testimony that I heard at the last hearing regarding post-census local review, I am not convinced that it worked that well in 1990. Uh, most of the communities that participated were displeased with the process, and less than 20 percent of the government governmental units participated at all. Thus, the Census Bureau's comments regarding this issue will be noteworthy because I remain concerned about a serious undercount, especially in rural and minority communities. Finally, I'm pleased that within the initiatives proposed as a recommendation for a waiver to allow individuals who receive federal assistance to work as part-time enumerators without having their benefits affected. Therefore, I commend you and Representative Meek for the work on this legislation. Again, I look forward to all of the witnesses and appreciate your call in this hearing today. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Pruitt, uh, Dr. Pruitt, if you'd raise your stand and raise your right hand and where you're in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, sir. Dr. Pruitt, you have an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Davis, and especially for this opportunity to present and answer questions on the Census 2000 Operation Plan, uh, first sent to this subcommittee six weeks ago, and subsequently refined to incorporate the evaluation based upon the Census Bureau's dress rehearsal experience. I appreciate as well the opportunity to comment on Chairman Miller's 10 suggestions for how to improve the census. Uh, later in my comments, I will divide this 10-point list into two categories on seven of the items. We welcome the approach taken by the chairman. They are consistent with what the Census Bureau has learned about how to strengthen the census. Uh, we obviously readily embrace a more extensive advertising campaign, an effort to reach 100 percent of the nation's schools greater resources for the partnership program, additional enumerators, uh, partnership with AmeriCorps volunteers, and the waiver initiative. And in each of these areas, if time allows, I can outline what the Census Bureau has already itself initiated. On three of the items, the second mailing, the language initiative, and local government review of mailing addresses, the Census Bureau believes it has presented a superior program than the way in which the chairman has set forth his views. Indeed, in some instances, if legislated in the manner before you, these proposals would disrupt Census 2000 and could even put it at risk. I will have to expre express those views rather strongly. I will, of course, allocate more time to those three in which there are differences than to the seven on which there is general agreement. But first, uh, if I may, a word about the Census. It has unique features, making it one of the most complicated operations conducted by the U.S. government. Think of it as a three-dimensional task. Its account is an address list, and it's a date. We have to count every resident of the United States, estimated to be about 275 million in 2000. We have to identify every residential address in the United States, estimated to be about 120 million in 2000. And then we have to assign the 275 million people to the 120 million addresses on a fixed single date, April 1st. Each of these operations is enormous, People are on the move, addresses come and go, and this movement and transformation does not conveniently pause just because Census Day is the 1st of April. It is because the task is huge and complex, as you've acknowledged, and I appreciate that, that the Census Bureau is very careful in how it proceeds. To the extent possible, and especially for procedures not used in prior censuses, we test everything and weigh what works and what is not. Hours of deliberation, even argument, precede a decision to build any given procedure into the census. Census staff take turns challenging each other to prove the merits of a given operation. Nothing is haphazard, nothing is casual. Every step is carefully, deliberately considered. In this lengthy process, which started for the 2000 census 12 years ago, just as in 2000 we will test procedures that might be incorporated in 2010, we select and discard based on one overriding criteria. Will this procedure or operation lead to a more accurate and complete count? Selection among alternative procedures is based not on what is more or less difficult, but what is more or less productive. To suggest that the Census Bureau excludes a particular procedure 
because it would be too much trouble, reflects a serious misrepresentation of the dedication and commitment of the Census Bureau career professionals. Then, when all of the pieces are put together, when the whole is assembled, testing starts all over again. For now, we must determine how well the integrated system will work, not just the individual pieces. As the chairman knows, because he visited our beta testing sites in Suitland, this too is a painstaking task. We currently have in test 25 major software systems. They not only have to work in their own terms, they have to fit together. We have to track 175 million farms, pay hundreds of thousands of workers, monitor tens of thousands of partnership programs, produce 12 million maps. Every step, every operation, every procedure is at huge scale and is interdependent with every other step, operation, or procedure. This operational plan, as refined in this update, was submitted to you six weeks ago. It's a census plan. This census plan, as you know, is now being documented, documented in excruciating detail in what the Census Bureau terms its master activity schedule. The master activity schedule is 4,000 lines of individual code. But it is more than that. It is a software program that shows how each one of these individual steps connects with every other step in the census. Every procedure links to previous procedures. Every procedure links horizontally to all other procedures and forward to dozens of other procedures. This morning, I sat in what we call our lockup room, windowless in the basement of, as you know, not a very nice building. 50 people down there tracking every single line of this code to make sure that it fits together. Nothing is left out, no mistakes are made. When completed in approximately two weeks, it will be a very substantial set of detailed operations about how to conduct the census. The point is, we have to sort of establish these procedures now. I beg the subcommittee, please do not impose on us the burden of going into the census with just-in-time programming, which we will have to do if we add things once this is finished. Don't impose on us the burden of going in with untested procedures or with additions whose consequences for other operations will not be discovered until they happen. The operational machinery that constitute a census is not something to be taken lightly. Now, you've asked me to focus on procedures to enhance traditional enumeration procedures and also to comment on the 10-point list of suggestions under Act America Counts today. Mr. Chairman, I intend no disrespect, but I do have to emphasize that Act does not itself constitute a census plan. It is a series of isolated initiatives. I do not make light of these initiatives and have already indicated that we readily embrace seven of them. I only suggest that they are not a plan. For example, they speak to only a tiny part of the huge operation described in Census 2000 as the master address file. Except indirectly, and in this instance not helpfully, they have little to do with the enormous optical scanning operation planned for Census 2000. They do not help us with the difficult issue of unduplication, with the operations needed to validate the housing units that are vacant, and so on and so on. Again, we welcome seven of the initiatives, have serious reservations about three, but more generally, I have to describe them for what they are, isolated suggestions. They are not a census plan. This, Mr. Mr. Chairman, compared to this, is what turns something into a census plan that has to be managed and operated with something in the, in the multiple thousands of people, as we all know. Take, for example, how to reach the linguistically isolated in our population. We welcome the chairman's interest in this most difficult area and can assure the subcommittee that we intend to be as linguistically friendly as we possibly can. We do, however, believe that the program set forth in the operational plan reaches Mr. Miller's goal more efficiently than printing census forms in 33 languages. We are printing forms in six languages that account for 99% of all of the households in the United States. Does this mean that we are indifferent to the other 1% of the households? which speak, by the way, not just 27 additional languages, but about 120 additional languages over the main, in the main six. The Census Bureau gave a lot of attention to how to reach these population groups. But of course, it wanted to do so in a manner that, not, that did not place other census operations at risk, such as how many pages of the form can be optically scanned. We subjected this issue to what we, may call, what we call a business analysis. 
28 pages of detailed analysis listing all the pros and cons of not just one but four major alternatives. In the end, we designed a careful operation to reach those ling linguistically isolated households. I invite you to study it carefully before leaping to the conclusion that we did not give careful consideration to the, to the idea that's embedded in the draft legislation before this committee. We did consider that idea. We did not reject it because it was too hard. We rejected it because it would not do the job. Instead, we have set forth an integrated language program that involves 15,000 paid temporary staff positions in the questionnaire assistance centers drawn from a wide range of language communities, as well as the preparation of 15 million assistant guides in several dozen languages. We have also included a language focus in our partnership agreements with community organizations. All of this to reach that 1% of the population which does, which does not speak one or more of the six languages already covered in our census operations. Were the bill before you to pass, the following would have to happen. We would have to renegotiate, renegotiate, renegotiate all of our largest contracts, including nearly 20 printing contracts, the contracts for our telephone questionnaire assistance program, for our data capture initiative, and for the data capture service centers. The entire workflow for the receipt, image capture, transcription, and key from paper would have to be modified. Let me offer just one simple example. Here is what we call our pre-census letter, our letter to alert all of the American households that the census form is come, coming. It will go to 120 million households. The wording has been carefully designed to minimize confusion and to maximize cooperation. After internal discussion, it was decided that the best way to announce the availability of the five languages other than English would be to put a very small set of reminders down here at the bottom, and then on the back, list in the five languages how to get a questionnaire in those languages. I would invite you, if you would like to persist with this legislation, to imagine how we're now going to do this, but announce to the American public that there are 33 languages. The letter won't work. 99% of the households are now getting a piece of paper which bears not at all on their conditions. That's not the way we would design a census. We would do it in such a way as to try to minimize confusion, maximize cooperation, and indeed put in place a mechanism that will reach all of those linguistically isolated communities. Similarly with the second mailing, which I will not here consider in detail. But again, there is research. There is analysis, there is deliberation, there is judgment, there is the dress rehearsal experience, all of which indicates that the value of the second mailing is outweighed substantially so by the risk that it introduces into other census operations, not least of which is the deterioration in data quality and non-response follow-up. The targeted mailing is operationally impractical. The blanket mailing postpones non-response follow-up by approximately six weeks. Also with a post-census review, which I've discussed in some detail in my written testimony, why the Census Bureau replaced a procedure that worked poorly in 1980 and 1990 with a much stronger, more extensive procedure in 2000. I should take more, no more time in these opening comments. I, re I appreciate the time that you've given me, but I do hope that the question period will provide time to examine why the Census Bureau's carefully considered programs should be the ones that we move forward at this point. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Pruitt. Um, we'll work under the five-minute rule, but we have more than one round, probably. Um, <laughs> Lights not working, so we'll just do the best we can. There we go. Uh, the um, first of all, you know, I get concerned that the statements by the uh, uh, minority and by, by the Census Bureau that Congress is almost irrelevant to this process is kind of offending. Um, we don't know the details of the plan. Yes, you have a book there, but the details aren't there. You know that. We don't have a budget. Two weeks, you say we'll have it. And we're supposed to wait until it's out. And then we're supposed to get involved in it. Well, you know, the agreement back, actually passed into law back in 1997, was that you're going to have a dual track and be prepared. Now, I, you weren't there, I know, and you just uh, took, went to the Bureau in uh, October. But we should have been prepared, and this information should have been out months ago. And I think you would have been pleased to have had it out months ago. But uh, instead, the uh, administration, the Clinton administration, the Bureau, it decided to only go on one track, unlike what the law said back in 1997. And, uh, and so we've 
all of a sudden have to scramble now to put together the plan. And it's unfortunate that we're having to wait this long. And we cannot wait any longer. And we need to move forward because, as I've said before, we all agree. Um, I think we want to focus today on what we can to improve the thing. And I'm glad to see that you know, a number of the ideas um, you know, are going to be acceptable, that we you know, help because we are trying to reach the same goal. But let me start off with post census local review. We, we did have a hearing on that issue. And I am just still baffled why the opposition to it. Um, this is, in effect, an audit after the, uh, ad, uh, the uh, mailings have gone out. Uh, what you're doing with uh, uh, LUCA is very fine, and I'm very pleased that it's uh, um, you know, there. And that's good. I mean, there's a lot of good programs there, and that, that's one that we're complimenting. But it doesn't replace, in my opinion, post census local review. This all boils down to the issue of trust. We've been saying trust for the past year and a half, and there's a real trust problem here. And if, if people don't trust the numbers, we've got a failed census. And what's wrong? I don't see the harm of post census local review. I don't see what the problem is uh, in, in having this post census local review. Um, the LUCA program has been successful to some extent, not as many as we'd like to have participate. But I think we can you know, build upon it and do a better job with, um, I would tell me why, I don't understand what, what damage does it do? What harm does it do uh, to the thing? Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, Mr. Chairman, excuse me. I'm still learning the protocol. Uh, no, uh, That's my first hearing. Um, but I, I, I'm a little confused why this is not a plan. Uh, well, do you have a budget with the details in it? Do you have the master activity no, is, is, schedule? I'm sorry, I'm just really trying to, to learn. Well, as I said, the master activity schedule um, is, uh, is not a plan. It's something that turns this into a set of activities. I mean, this is detailed about our coverage improvement follow-up, our enumeration strategy, our advertising strategy. Uh, dress rehearse res results. I mean, it, it seems to Mike, to me, like this would be a plan. I don't, I'm, I'm just confused about what, what, in your mind, constitutes a plan. We no? had a lot more detail on the illegal plan that the courts threw out. That detail was provided. Now, this one, we're scrambling to put together the detail we had before. So, uh, we're, we're actually, we, I mean, you, you think that's a complete plan that you can go out and... Could, what, do you have a budget? Isn't that part of a plan? How much money are we going to spend? We don't know yet. Yeah. I mean, I just found out last week you're going to have a, an ACE. I mean, right. isn't a budget part of a plan? I'm trying to, I'm simply trying to yeah. understand. But the details are missing is all I'm saying. There are some, you know, there's okay, a lot fine. of parts. Just so we understand that we do, we you have, do a plan. have some serious details here. Well, and, but there's a lot of uh, details indeed, missing. Uh, well, serious details on many of the things that you have now put into your ideas. That's fine. Um, I just okay. make sure I understand we're talking about the same thing. We talk about what is a plan. Um, the, uh, the... Post census, look, I, I, would you like me to comment on this? Because I, I would have to have some clarification on this. I don't, I don't, I don't uh, my, my current information says that the, uh, the cooperation with our, our current LUCA program uh, covers about 86% of all the addresses in the United States. So I'm, I'm just not sure. I don't know where you, I just don't know what this is based right, well, on. We'll get, but but what, what harm does that, the uh, post census local review do? What harm is, da what damage is done if we do the post census? Look, review that we give communities a chance to review the numbers. I mean, Ms. Maloney said there was, was 124,000 people added in 1990. Well, they're not important to Ms. Maloney, apparently, because oh, we don't, we should count everybody. Oh, yes. I mean, everybody yes, says everybody should be yeah. counted. I mean, tell Mayor Archer that 45,000 people didn't matter. Tell Congressman Petri that up in Wisconsin, with some ward in his area, was left out. It was, you know, you know, I don't know the details of it. He thought it was just a computer error. Mistakes are made. I mean, you know, you know you're not perfect, obviously. Um, but you know, we want to catch mistakes and we want local communities to trust the numbers. So just, you know, what harm is done having this at the end? It's, this is in addition to LUCA. Uh, well, let's try again, try to establish what, what LUCA does. Um, LUCA is an attempt, uh, and we think a reasonably successful attempt thus far, uh, though we've got much more work to do and we will continue to do it right up until March 31, 2000, with it. Uh, to, to uh, list every address in the United States and, and actively, actively involve local governments in putting together that address list. Good. That's, Good. That, but that's what, that's what the post-census LUCA was about. Post-census LUCA was to say, did we get every address in your community? Right. And we are now doing that before we, before we go to the field. It seems like a, a perfectly reasonable thing for, for us to be doing. Yeah, my, so, my time's up, but it sounds like you say we're perfect and we don't make mistakes. There's no computer errors. I mean, mistakes happen. And why can't local communities have a chance to check the numbers? It's an audit after the fact. It's like, you know, 
I'm a, in the, from the private sector when I came into Congress, and we had audits. I served on a lot of boards of nonprofits. We always had an audit. If someone came to me as a chief financial officer of an organization and said, oh, we don't want to have an audit, we'll save some money, we'll skip that audit, I'd be really suspect. What are you trying to hide? And this is the type of doubts you raise. Why are we afraid to let a local mayor, county commission, look at the numbers. I don't understand now, the you're danger. Talking about, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm talking about we're, post-census We're local talking group. about numbers, not, not, not addresses. You actually, so post-census local you, ask, you are asking us to ask 39,000 jurisdictions to look over our actual counts? Well, the, no, the population December counts? program we had in 1990. Mm -hmm. Population counts, not, not addresses. The housing counts. Mm -hmm. the housing counts? The same way we did in 1990, basically. We're allowed a little more time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what yep. the harm is. I haven't found the harm. Yep. My time's up, so let me. We'll come back sure, because we're sure. going another round, Ms. Surely. Maloney. So maybe you can think about what harm is done. Surely. You you uh, point of personal privilege. You you mentioned that I thought 124,000 people didn't count. I think they count very, very much. But I think the number should be much higher. And what happened in 1990, as I understand it, is there was very low participation. Therefore, the Census Bureau came back with a new plan that checked housing and addresses prior that involved the, uh, the counties and the localities. The director just said it to the point of 86 percent as opposed to the 5 percent success rate here. I think that we should have for the record where these numbers came from since he doesn't appear to know. Don't recognize them, sorry. I, I would like to just take your question and ask it in a different way. You said, what harm will the post-census local review be? I'd like to ask it in the way of what will it add? Will it add anything to your, your ability to count every American? It was my understanding you started the, the pre-census to make the count even better, but... Well, uh, what, what we tried to, to set forth in, in, in our plan is a number of coverage improvement strategies, starting with getting the address list right, um, because if we don't get the address list right, we will not have a, a quality census, and a lot of time and effort and a lot of cooperation with the U.S. Congress uh, on, that, on that score. Um, and then a series of coverage improvement as I tried to say in my opening comments, we look at a whole portfolio of procedures and operations and then choose the ones which we think can fit within nine months, uh, which is a very, very serious constraint to make our, our December 31 uh, obligations. Uh, pick those procedures which will maximize the accuracy and the completeness of the count. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, and we actually think that the procedures that you haven't yet one to spend any time on, the coverage improvement strategies, uh, are much superior, much superior to post-census local review. If we thought post-census local review, having already gotten the address list right, would be uh, successful, we would want to do it. It just simply won't add up to what we think we have produced in its place. It's not as if we don't want to count everyone, uh, and we obviously do. Uh, we're, we're professionals. That's our job. And, uh, and we would be very disappointed on behalf of our professional responsibilities in the American public if we didn't count everyone. We know it's going to be difficult in 2000. We've been saying that for years. We know why it's going to be difficult. So I'm sorry. I, I, I should edit myself better. I, I've heard some of my um, Republican colleagues say that we need a, a general to take over the running of the Census Bureau. Uh, what, in your opinion, would be the comments of a general uh, to these uh, added proposals at the last minute at this late date? Uh, well, uh, Mrs. Molly, generals sometimes speak in rather earthly um, <laughs> vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I would want to directly quote, uh, I, I honestly think that, and I would invite the, 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 the subcommittee to ask General Schwarzkopf, who's been frequently used in this connection, uh, to come and, and, and answer that question. What would you do, General Schwarzkopf, is just as you were going into the field, a subcommittee of the Congress came along and said, oh, we like this better than what you're talking about. We want you to do this instead of that. I think the general would say, uh, no. <laughs> or, or words to that effect. Um, and I, I, would, uh, I would invite you to put that question to a general about what it's like to manage the largest peacetime operational uh, uh, activity mobilization in, in, in U.S. history. 
As, as I mentioned in my, my opening statement, because it's been rather troubling to me, the repeated attacks, slurs on the professionals at the Census Bureau, and, and what have these attacks done to the morale of the really uh, most of whom are career professionals at the Census Bureau? Well, I, I, I think we would like to believe that people who use that language just don't believe them. Uh, I think if we really believe that people did believe those, the language that's being used, the way we're being described, uh, it would be deeply disappointing. I, could I just take a minute? I want to... Um, I'd like to just show the subcommittee uh, this document. Uh, this is a uh, questionnaire called the Consumer Expenditure Survey, which the Census Bureau collects on a routine basis using, of course, modern statistical methods. Uh, this is the data which go into the CPI. Uh, the CPI goes into Alan Greenspan's head when he's talking about the state of the economy as well as the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, which are based on census collections, of course, um, and also uh, uh, the uh, capa industrial capacity data, which is, again, a Census Bureau uh, survey. I, I just don't think that Alan Greenspan thinks that when he's talking to you about the state of the economy based upon these census data that he's peddling snake oil. I think he thinks he's peddling the very best data that can be produced by the, the Keystone Statistical Agency of the United States. And, and I, I, obviously, if, 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 if members of Congress really think that the Census Bureau, when it does this kind of work, is, is producing stuff which cannot be used, cannot be trusted, then we have a very serious problem in this society. I just don't believe it. So, so I have to tell you that, that the reason that morale doesn't suffer as much as you might imagine is we simply can't believe that people who say that actually believe it because they turn around in other parts of their job and use the data all of the time. When they make economic policy, when they make social policy, when they look at the poverty rates, when they look at educational statistics, they're using these kind of data all of the time. So I can't believe that they don't believe in the quality of that work. Mm -hmm. Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, we've had some discussion relative to the proposed initiatives that the chairman um, is presenting today. Did I understand you to suggest that if we get into the business of starting with something different at this juncture, that there are currently plans in process that would have to be changed, such as contracts that have been let and, and initiatives that are currently underway? Uh, well, yes, sir. Um, I, I, with respect, say, to the, the, the language program that's been uh, uh, suggested by the, Mr. Miller, um, we would simply, as I did try to say, we would have to renegotiate every one of our major contracts, every one of our major contracts. Uh, it would be extremely difficult for us to meet the April 1st deadline if we have to do that. Uh, we would have to rewrite not only this plan, but all of these 4,000 lines of code, because all of these things connect to each other. Uh, the same thing with the second mailing. If we use the second mailing, we would have to rewrite every bit of this. We would have to start again. Uh, with respect to post-census post LUCA, that's an entirely different procedure, which we've not built into our plan and our design. So yes, I, I simply have to say in all candor, that uh, if we were asked late in the game to put in a procedure which was not already part of our operational plan, that it could put the census at risk. You've indicated that we would probably miss the deadline. Do you have any projections as to by perhaps how much or how long well, it, it would take to renegotiate those? Oh, I think we're talking uh, uh, certainly weeks and maybe months uh, to renegotiate the contracts um, and, and then to re you know, as I say, we've already have 19 printing contracts out there. Um, and it's very hard for me to estimate because it depends on the nature of the, uh, of, of the suggestions that would be introduced or be legislated by the, by the Congress. Um, and when we would learn those. Uh, I mean, it's one thing if these things were, were you know, said, okay, this, today this is the law, uh, we would scramble as best we could. Uh, if we learn that in June, it's one thing. If we learn in September, it's, it's just simply something else. We are at a point in this census which if we don't get about it, we're not going to get it done. I cannot say that more strongly. 
let's say for some reason we miss the deadline. I mean, other than the fact that it's been missed, what happens? Well, uh, there, are, there are three key dates, uh, Mr. Davis. One is April 1st, since the state 2000. The next one is nine months later, December 31, uh, apportionment numbers. And the next one is April 1st, uh, by which time we have to have provided all 50 states their redistricting data. Obviously, if, if and, and everything that we do is geared around trying to make those dates. And we work, uh, I, in, my, in the morning, this morning when I was in the lockup room watching these people work, the thing that got flashed up on the screen was, aha, uh -huh, calendar number four. This procedure gets matched against calendar number four. Calendar number four is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from April 1st until April 1st. They're now planning against a, a calendar that has no space in it. They're down there in that basement room arguing about hours and half days. If you need that half day for this, you can't have it because I need a day and a half for that. That's the argument that's going on. There is not space in there. You put something in that takes six weeks, like the second mailing, I, it's a different census. Could we do it? Sure, we can do anything, I guess. Would it be accurate? No. We would reduce accuracy at this point if we start trying to introduce entirely new procedures into the, the, the operational plan that already exists. So you're saying that we would get the exact opposite result than what is being desired. That, that rather than enhancing our ability to, to, to get accurate information, that we're really creating a level of confusion that will make it virtually impossible to get accurate information. Um. I'm afraid, Mr. Davis, that that's, uh, I'm, I wouldn't have put it in quite such blunt words. I'm afraid that you've, you have interpreted me correctly. Um, we start with as many different procedures as we can imagine. We're all on the table. And then you, people go into rooms and they argue this versus that. This is going to give us more accuracy. This is going to give us more, a more complete count. And that's going to take seven days, but this only takes four days, but that will take 13 days. Let's do this, not that, and so forth. That's the discussion that goes on. Then you put it all together and you start testing it. And then once it's tested, to start taking it apart is very risky. It means we will go into the field without the software system having been tested, without making sure that it integrates across these 25 different big software uh, packages. Uh, it, 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 it just is a very difficult way to do a census. And that's why I would go back to General Schwarzkopf. I would love to have him sitting here with me today and asking him, what would you do if you were asked to make these kinds of changes in an operational plan at this late date? They're not bad ideas, necessarily. Uh, they were the ones that we're not using. We think we have superior ideas on languages, on the mailing, on, on, the, on, the, on the involvement of local governments in address list. They're not bad ideas. We simply worked hard to put together a better version of that idea in our judgment. And that's what we get paid to do. We're doing the best job we can. Finally, um, we have another round. If you okay. okay. Oh, we'll, well, let me start uh, back. And, um, it was interesting you brought up Mr. Greenspan and the CPI. That was an interesting one because I've sat on the budget committee for six years. And Mr. Greenspan came before our committee about four years ago and said the CPI is overstated by two points and uh, went through the problems. We had hearings both on the appropriation committee I served at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and on the budget committee about the problems with it, about substitution rates and such and how they need to update it. Now, this is, a, you, know, you know, these great statistical methods, but it was overstating CPI by two points, according to Alan Greenspan. Now, they're starting to correct some of these problems. So we, you bring up an illustration of, you know, statistical methods make mistakes. And now we're acknowledging that there have been mistakes made with CPI. So that's a good illustration you brought up. So I'm glad that, that was discussed. Let me uh, go back to post-census local review. I mean, the Census Advisory Committee people support post-census local review. Uh, local governments, I haven't found a local person that was opposed to it. The National League of Cities ha have supported it. Um, and they, these local cities deal with the, this uh, LUCA program. And the LUCA program's fine. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, it, you know, it's not reached as many people as we want, I don't think. But uh, uh, it's reached a you know, fair number, and we wish we could get more people to participate in it. But I am getting back to the question is, what harm will be done? You know, there was a New York Times article, there's your quote up there, it says, it's an incentive for anyone to try to boost their numbers for either economic or political gain. 
what's wrong with that? Why shouldn't the mayor of Detroit, the mayor of Charlotte, the mayor of New York City, you know, want to get numbers? And why shouldn't they say, hey, you missed this uh, block in your numbers? I mean, you know, uh, I don't see the harm. And it, it's not something that's untested because you did it in 1990. You should be able to do a better job on it in, 19, in 2000. No, I, I'm actually certain that if we did it in 2000, we would do a better job than we did in 1990. Everything that we worked with in 1990 that we've introduced into 2000, we've improved on those procedures. Um, just quickly, um, uh, 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 on the um, advisory council uh, committee that you cited, and as well as a number of other local um, leaders, uh, I, I think perhaps your staff has reported back to you that to a person, to a person, everyone in the Census Advisory Committee asked that this not be legislated. That if they were here today, they would be all suggesting to you that to try to legislate a procedure at this late stage in the census cycle is very risky business. Um, and so I, I only point that out to you, and if your staff didn't mention that to you, they didn't give you a full report on that meeting, uh, Mr. Chairman. Now, um, with respect to, um, to this quote, um, the, the Founding Fathers were, as we know, unusually uh, intelligent. Um, and when they first introduced the idea of a census for purposes of apportionment, they were very worried that the uh, states would inflate their numbers. And what they put into the initial design was that the count of the population in each state would be used for two purposes, one of which was apportionment, and the other one of which was for taxation. And they argued and they said the reason that we want both of those in there is that one is an incentive to increase the numbers, to inflate them, and the other is an incentive to keep them down. And that's the way in which we have confidence that this procedure of asking the local governments to tell us how many people there are, that there will be some sort of check on them. Um, now, what this uh, quote suggests, and I certainly won't, uh, won't uh, um, I, I will, uh, say that it is certainly a direct quote, um, that the, if you actually give 39,000 jurisdictions a count and there is anything they can do to increase that count, whether that's validated or not, why wouldn't they want to do it? As I said in um, uh, the, the, the comment that I made leading into this uh, particular quote, I was in a meeting in, in Albuquerque and a mayor of a, of a, of a fast-growing city came over to me uh, on the podium uh, and said, we have a fast-growing city, we need 50,000 people in our city because our city depends upon uh, retail taxes. And if we get above 50,000, then we will be get a shopping mall. And he came over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Mr. Director, your job is to make sure there are 50,000 people in my city. That's not my job. My job is to find out how many people are in his city, which may be 47,000, may be 53,000. My job isn't to give him the number he wants. My job is to give an accurate count without an undercount, without missing the Hispanics. Uh, Mr. Waxman mentioned the, uh, the number of states which lost money. All of them are heavily, heavily concentrated uh, Hispanic populations. Doesn't surprise me they're the states that miss money because those are the states where we miss people and we know it. So my job is not to go out and find the number that some mayor needs. My job is to find out how many people are actually there, as best we can do. And that's our task. And so, yes, you do create an incentive. Wouldn't you but, admit that? Wouldn't you agree? Right, you want the incentive, but you're, you know, the Census Bureau is going to be the judge if they're real people. The Founding Fathers very specifically didn't trust the states, you're right to say that. That's the reason they're, they were suspect of the, They didn't even know about sampling back then. But the concept of sampling allows for that manipulation. The exact thing that the Founding Fathers were concerned about is trusting the states with it. Now we want to tr trust a political system to get involved with it. And that's what the no, real I, danger. I, 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 I mean, think what you're asking with post census Luca is you want 39,000 political jurisdictions to be but, involved. But you in will count. judge if they're real people. If they're not real people, they're not going to be counted. But they should have the right to say, hey, you missed somebody. You don't think they should have that right now. Because you're not going to make any mistakes. The Bureau, I mean, I, a lot of professionals there. I don't want to criticize them. Right, thank you. But, I mean, what the, but there's going to be mistakes. You're going to have to admit. I mean, yes. But now you're saying we don't, want to, we don't trust the local communities to make that. I mean, I mean that's what you're saying. Oh. You just don't trust them. It, you know, and I don't understand. I haven't found a reason we shouldn't have it. Um, you know, actually, we need to, we're going to go through a couple rounds here. So sure. I mean, you know, let me go to Carolyn Maloney, Ms. Maloney. Okay. Uh, 
Doc, Dr. Pruitt, um, one of the greatest uh, concerns that state and local governments have in regard to local review is to make sure that all new construction is counted. And actually, actually Chairman Miller, this was one of the items that was raised in our hearing in, in Arizona where there is a, a tremendous amount of new construction taking place. And, and they want to make sure that, it's, it, that it is counted up to April 1st, 2000, that it receives a, a census form. And uh, do you agree that this is a legitimate concern, and are you doing anything in the Census Bureau to address it? Uh, uh, Mrs. Maloney, uh, uh, two things uh, have led to that concern, one of which is our dress rehearsal experience, uh, where there, that we did encounter, especially in, um, in, in Sacramento, well, in South Carolina, a large... Uh, influx of new, new, new construction, and then the, the the recommendation of our various advisory committees. So uh, we have uh, now um, included a procedure that allows the local governments to ad add addresses, especially of new construction and recently inhabited new construction, uh, right up to March 31st, 2000. Um, that is a, a difficult procedure. Uh, we we embrace it. Uh, it has the nice property that it slides into procedures we already had in place. And that really is important uh, because we're going to have duplication. That is, two things happen between um, uh, late fall and early spring of, uh, late fall of 99, early spring of 2000. Two things are happening, one of which is a postal casing check where we go to every post office and ask them to take our address list and see if they can add anything to it. That should have found all of that new construction. But we weren't convinced that would find all the new construction, so we added a separate procedure, uh, which goes back to the local governments, back with our address list, even if they didn't participate in LUCA, they're going to get this opportunity, and say, are there any new housing units since we finalized this address list? If so, it puts into the mail stream. The problem is, just so you know how complicated it is, is two things are now feeding into that mail stream. One is the postal casing check, and one is the local government. Um, there will be duplications. Some addresses will appear twice. We have to unduplicate those. And then we have to send an enumerator out to make sure the address really is there, which we will do, and then to enumerate the residents. So yes, we have now put in place something that slides into our procedures in a way to bring that address list up to date till the very last minute before census day. Census day is really important. You gotta count people on April 1st. If somebody dies, uh, the afternoon before, they shouldn't be counted. If a, if a baby is born the next day, they shouldn't be counted. Everything has got to happen on that single day or we don't have an accurate count. Mm -hmm. Could you um, comment on, on two, two areas? In 1990, very few local governments participated in the post census local review. Could you comment on why you think so few participated? I understand you got the participation up to 86% with the pre-census, that, that's really quite remarkable. Yeah, and, it, and, and have you identified your professionals or the department identified that if you had additional resources, uh, what would you inst institute before post-census review if, the, if res resources were available that would make the, the count more reliable or accurate? Do you have any other ideas that you'd like to Surely. add? Well, with respect to the, um, uh, the local involvement of, uh, in our address list, um, we indeed uh, are very pleased this time around. We think we actually put together a better program, by far uh, a better program, and one which had more time built into it, which had more interaction with local governments, uh, and, and which they recognized how critical it was to get that address list right before we went into the field. Uh, and I think that's why 86% of the addresses in the United States have fallen into that program. I should say, by the way, I don't interpret 14 percent as, as, uh, as unimportant. My guess is some communities did not participate because they realized we would do a good job without their participation, uh, that maybe the address list is so straightforward as there are in some communities. So I, I, I'm not even anxious about the, the ones that didn't cooperate uh, because we think every city that wanted to cooperate, needed to cooperate, uh, had the opportunity to do so. Additional resources. Um, uh, say a word about resources. Um, the, the, the Census Bureau uh, appreciates uh, the, the, the generosity expressed by Congressman Miller and other um, members of Congress saying we will pay whatever it takes and so forth. Um, 
and we, we do appreciate because we're under enormous burden uh, to, to be accurate and to, to fully count. Um, on the other hand, the Census Bureau does not want to spend more money than it needs to. Uh, we have a responsibility to the American taxpayer as well as the American public. Uh, and we do not want to put in procedures which just because they seem to make sense on the surface but would be costly, uh, but we, in our judgment, our professional judgment, they won't add accuracy uh, and they won't add to the count. So we actually all the time are looking at something and asking, um, is, is, it, is it going to give us real value for the money? Are we going to get real productivity out of this procedure? So you will find us, uh, in some instances, suggesting that perhaps, for some reasons, we should not spend as much money as perhaps uh, would, uh, would be coming out of, out of one source or another. Uh, we, we, well, let me stop there. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Davis? Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Pruitt, we know that advertising is a substantial part of the overall process, yet we know that, that advertising is not necessarily going to give us the bottom line results that we're looking for. Are there categories, or who are the categories of people who are likely to be least impacted by the advertising campaign? Um. Mr. Davis, the advertising campaign is designed to increase the mail response uh, return because every extra percent we get in mail response return lessens the pressure on us to go out and enumerate uh, the, in our, what we call our non-response follow-up. Um, the hard to count, the really hard to count, are a very special, once you get into that, you, you've gotten 94%, you've gotten 96%, you've maybe even gotten to 97 and a half. It really gets difficult for all of those extra, the, the additional hard to count uh, people. We do not anticipate that the advertising campaign will, will, will be particularly successful at reaching those people. Let me put it this way. Um, the advertising campaign rests upon a model of civic engagement. It, it rests upon an idea that we should make people aware of the census, educate them to, their, to the importance of it, uh, and, and, and engage it. The partnership program rests upon the same kind of general model. The problem is that the hard to count, the really difficult to reach, the alienated, the angry, the I don't want to be bothered people, are the same people that are going to be hard to find in a partnership program the same people who are going to be hard to reach with an advertising strategy. So I, 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 I welcome uh, Mr. Miller's uh, interest in expanding and strengthening our partnership program. We really deeply believe in it. I welcome the commitment to expanding the advertising program, but it would be imprudent of me to suggest that that will solve the fundamental problem that we will have a differential undercount. There will be certain population groups in the United States which will be counted. They will be racial groups, I regret to say because they're the groups which live in two things go into the undercount. There are housing attributes, crowded housing, housing don't have regular addresses, uh, 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 irregular housing patterns, and then there are person attributes, poverty, lack of education, unemployment, high mobility. Certain population groups particularly racial minorities in this society, have a preponderance of both the housing attributes, which make it difficult to count, and the person attributes, which make it difficult to count. Put those things together, it will, it's just, it's simply very difficult to find 100% of people who have that set of housing attributes and that set of personal attributes. So the advertising campaign, the partnership program, the promotion efforts really matter. It will turn this census, I hope, into a census the American people will will participate in, be proud of, uh, but it will not reach the hardest account and they will be differentially spread across different racial groups. What about second mailings? Well, second mailing is a, uh, a Census Bureau actually tested and thought about, did a lot of research. I brought a lot of the research with me today if you'd like to peruse it uh, on the second mailing. The problem with the targeted mailing, which is the one that we initially wanted to do, which is the most uh, 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 appropriate, it's very, very, the, the targeted mailing adds six weeks. So we simply had to set it aside because what you have to do is, forms have to come in, you have to then code them all, find out who, who answered and who didn't, then find the ones that didn't, remail it, wait for those to come in. We went to our printing contractors, we went to other uh, uh, of our consultants, they all said six weeks. A real delay. If you wait six weeks 
before you go out to do non-response follow-up, the data and non-response follow-up begin to deteriorate. Because people forget where they were. They have memory lapses. They forget who lived in that apartment complex uh, 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 three months ago. And we're trying to find 40 million households. So there is, a, there is a, a, a real consequence of the targeted mailing. Therefore, blanket mailing. Close that time down. We tried blanket mailing. It produced duplicate responses. It produced a lot of confusion. We simply couldn't do it. The other thing to, may, to bear in mind about the second mailing is that's the part of the population which almost cooperated by definition. <laughs> They're the ones that, well, oh, I, f I forgot I should have and so forth. We're going to find them. Uh, we're going to enumerate them. We wish they had mailed it in in the first place, uh, but we're not going to miss them. That's not going to help us with that last three or four percent, that hard to count population group. And we know that half of that count is going to be children that we're going to find uh, not 100% not of the African Americans, but 95%. We're not going to find 100% of the American Indians, but maybe 88, 90, 90%. Same with the Hispanics, 95%. That second mailing wouldn't touch that problem at all. You've given me a good feeling that you're going to put forth and, and, and that we're going to put forth our best effort. And I think it's just most unfortunate that without utilization, of the scientific knowledge that we have, in spite of all that you're going to do, we're still going to come up short. I thank you very much. You. Um, let me go over some of the other areas in ACT so that we can, um, uh, as we continue this. Um, Mr. Davis brought up advertising. Um, have you got a proposed advertising budget yet? Or are you going to, is that going to be a couple of weeks before we get it? Or will Mr. Daly have it tomorrow? Or, um, I mean, it was 100 million originally, and yeah. Yep. Um, Mr. Miller, as you appreciate uh, in this hearing, I'm, I'm really not okay. supposed to be talking about budget numbers. So okay, I, I fine, fine. I, but, but there is going to be an increase from the original plan. Is that right in advertising? Uh, we hope so. Okay. Um, let me see. This is what's frustrating. I mean, we don't know what's happening. I well, mean, you ask for I, details, and I, you know, and, and you say, can't, don't, don't change it, but you, I can't show you the details until it's over. Oh. And then it's too late. I mean, that's kind of an interesting strategy being used. But at any rate, let me, let me ask you one thing. We had hearings in Miami and in Phoenix. And, for example, with the Haitian community in Miami, in Congresswoman Meeks' district, their great concern is to be able to have it as tailored to their community as possible. I mean, when you advertise, you should advertise in the Haitian radio station. Now, I know during the dress rehearsal, for example, on, up in the Dakotas on the Indian Reservation, the advertising wasn't, wasn't as tailored to that Indian Reservation as possible. How much flexibility is going to be in the advertising so that it's not just the New York ad agency doing it, so, but so that the Haitian radio station in Miami can have some tailored advertising. Is that going to be possible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In, 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 in great detail and great abundance. Okay. Um, because I think that's true for, you know, anything we can. The more flexibility at the local level, and that's the partnership specialists and such. So you are going to be increasing the number of partnership specialists. I think I've seen some numbers that fairly significantly because, you know, Working with the local community is very important. So you are increasing partnerships, right? Yes, sir. Specialists. Um, let me talk about the language for a minute. And we, we, since I mentioned the Haitian community, uh, you know, they, they speak Creole within a lot of the Haitian community, especially the new ones just coming over. How are they supposed to complete a form? Does someone have to, you have instructions, but then, but they can't, you know, they have to have someone else do it for them? Is that what you're saying? Or, I mean, uh, wouldn't yes. that make it easier if we could let at least the, the, the yeah, it doesn't have to be everybody in the country has a, cre a form in Creole. But within the Haitian community, Miami in particular, the, the, the uh, partnership specialists could help target and make them available. Why wouldn't we want to make it easier for the people, the Haitians, to fill out the form? Well, that, that uh, is what our, our uh, telephone assistance centers uh, will, will do and our um, 15,000 other specialists. We will draw them out of those language communities. Uh, we will uh, work with them with our partnership program, uh, other activities, work with them to go back into those communities where people haven't responded. Uh, we are talking about a, a small number, but nevertheless, we want to find them all. So I, I do think that our language program, uh, quite, quite honestly, I, Mr. Chairman, I really think our language uh, assistance program is as comprehensive and thoughtful as it can possibly be to reach even that last uh, less than 1% uh, uh, of the population. And I just invite you to uh, think, think with us uh, about the problem of taking, you've got a Creole population in, in, in Miami, um, and, and we're now sending a form up to Alaska, 
that says, aha, we can give you a Creole questionnaire. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a good way to go about doing this business. You want to be flexible and targeted. I, I did read the uh, testimony from the Miami, Miami hearing, um, uh, Mr. Miller, and I think the reason they came back to you and back to you and back to you on sampling is because they were afraid that all those people would not be counted unless we had something like an accuracy and coverage evaluation. But the courts have ruled we're going to do a full enumeration, and the concern we have is a two-number census. I, mean, I think you agree the Supreme Court did rule, and we're going to do a full enumeration. We, oh, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Here it is. And so, here it is. I mean, so yeah, we can talk about sampling. We can talk about sampling, but the fact is, you know, we need to do a full enumeration. And so, um, and that's just. I mean, I just. How about people that are blind? I guess they they'll have to, you know, do it by telephone. They're not allowed to fill out a form because we don't offer it in Braille. I guess. But I, I, mean, I would think for con Congresswoman in Meeks District, it'd be the, you know, why? I mean, she's got a fairly high concentration. I don't know what the number is, but uh, of uh, Haitians. So we should make it easier rather than more difficult. So um, let me um, uh, go to a couple of the other issues. The, um, the Meek bill that Congresswoman Meek talked about, are you, do you all support that bill? Or I was reading your testimony. I was a little, I wasn't sure. You, do you support that legislation that Congresswoman Meek has proposed? Well, we, we, uh, we know that recruiting the, the enumerators is a huge task. Uh, we've already had very substantial experience with and success at uh, welfare to work uh, recruits. Uh, we also know this runs into some complicated legal questions in 50, 50 states. Certainly, we support anything that will make it easier to us to recruit the, um, the enumerators we need. And if that turns out to be the waiver bill, good. Yes, sir. Well, I, I know. I didn't want to put words in Dr. Uh, Secretary Shalala's mouth, but she was at the appropriations hearing, and she, she had some legal doubts too. But uh, I mean, I think it, it can't hurt, and this kind of like post that's right. Review, right. Local review certainly can't, can't hurt, hurt the Census Bureau. You're can't right. Can't hurt the right. bureau, right. and neither does can't post Census local right. review. Congressman Maloney. <laughs> <laughs> the the bottom line is that we want to get the most accurate count possible, and we know what we got in the last count. We know what happened in 1990. We know that we missed 8.4 million people, that 4.4 million were counted twice. And we know that the people missed were largely children, Latinos, Asians, blacks, American Indians. So really the underlining question we have is how do we increase the count for particularly the undercounted areas? And in a bipartisan effort, and I'd like to quote from the Republican uh, former head of the Census Bureau, Dr. Barbara Bryant. And in talking on enumeration, she said, and I quote, enumeration cannot count everyone. Throwing more money at enumeration will not improve it. In 1990, we hit the wall trying to count everyone by enumeration. The 1990 census was adequately funded. There was no shortage of funds for hiring more enumerators or making additional efforts. And as we know, she was a strong supporter of a modern count to correct the undercount. So the bottom line is, we either correct the undercount or we knowingly go forward missing millions of Americans. That's the fundamental question before us. We know we're going to do enumeration for apportionment. That's over. We know the courts have said we can get a more accurate count for data, for distribution of funds, and for redistricting within the states. The only question before us is, are we going to get a more accurate count or not? Or are we deliberately going to go forward missing millions of Americans. Now, we've had many bells and whistles put before this committee, but if I understand your testimony, none of it improves the undercount. Am I right or wrong? Ms. Dr. Pruitt, would you comment? Well, um, re regretfully uh, not. I have explained in, in other forum, would, would uh, re-explain today if I may, that um, the, the and, and I appreciate that Mr. Miller uh, has characterized this as being defeatist. Um, it's not being defeatist. It's being honest. Uh, I would not want to. I would not want to mislead uh, either the U.S. Congress. It would not be my job to mislead the U.S. Congress or to mis mislead the American people. All of the conditions which make it difficult to count people, which we've experienced in 1980, 1970, again in 1990, they are growing. 
we have a better census. That is, this census is better than the 1990 census. So we are running harder to stay in place. Now, running harder to stay in place means that we will not count everyone. I hope we do as well as 1990. And it's not defeatist to say that. It's to recognize the blunt realities of the lack of civic engagement, of the alienation, of the mobile lifestyles, of the irregular housing, is to recognize those realities and to try to compensate as best we can for them. There will be an undercount, I'm afraid, and it will be differential. It will not be equally spread across all regions and all population groups. The rural poor, uh, the urban minorities, we will not find them at the same rate we find people living in the kind of neighborhoods we do. It just, that's the, those are the facts. I wish they weren't. The only way to know that after the fact will be if we do, as we have proposed, an accuracy and coverage evaluation. That will tell us after the fact how well we did up till December 31st. This is not a two-number census. There is one number for apportionment. That will be presented, as is our obligation, to the U.S. President by December 31st. The census is not over. That doesn't conclude the census. The census goes on. And we will continue to be as complete and accurate as we can be. And that will produce a more accurate set of numbers, which can be used for purposes other than apportionment. So, so it's very clear, my colleagues, what's before us. We either continue to miss millions of Americans who are disproportionately children and minorities, or we correct it. And we have the scientific community, which universally has come forward and pointed out the way to correct it, and the Census Bureau has built it into their plan for their accuracy and evaluation. Now, I have one question that I think is Let's tremendously more, important. More we'll I, I have to ask it right now, because it, it, I have a lot on my chest, and I'm beginning to get very angry with what I'm beginning to see here. And, and what, what I'm beginning to see and what I'm beginning to hear from the professionals is that some of these quote, improvements, which are not the improvements that are suggested by the scientific community, but the quote, improvements are going to hinder the Census Bureau. It's going to make it harder for them to come forward with an accurate crack, with an accurate count. I've heard you say that today. My question is, do you think it's deliberately being put forward by the Republican majority to just make the census professionals have a more difficult time or make it impossible for them to go forward. If you have to re-let all of your contracts, if you have to re-change all your programs, would you please comment? Um, well, if, if it's all right with Mrs. Baloney, I won't comment on motives. Uh, I can comment on consequences, uh, but not motives. Uh, I, I, I have every reason to believe that Mr. Miller wants a complete and accurate count. I, I would have to suggest that some of the things have been put on the table, uh, like the second mailing, um, uh, the post census LUCA, the uh, uh, language initiative, those three in particular, uh, if they were now put in, if they were now mandated by legislation, they would be very difficult. This, this thing would have to be start, we'd have to start aspects of this all over. Contracts, procedures, software, training, printing, publication, promotional materials. We'd have to, we'd have to sort of take a, a, a back look. And this is very late in the day to do that. So I cannot, I would not at all um, uh, impugn anyone's motives, uh, of course, but I would say that, that certain kinds of things have consequences that perhaps haven't been completely thought through. And that's why I welcome the opportunity to testify. Before I go, Mr. Davis, I just wanted to say I'm offended by Ms. Maloney's uh, accusation that uh, my motives are different. I thank you, Dr. Pruitt. Uh, we all want the best count possible. I think it's, it's going pretty low to start making those kind of accusations. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Pruitt, I just want to again thank you for your candor, for your forthrightfulness and professionalism. It seems to me that, that what you've suggested and what you're saying is that you really can't get blood out of a turnip. That, that you can take it, you can dice it, you can slice it, you can spice it, you can curl it, you can swirl it, but in the end you're still going to have turnip juice. 
and, 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 and I'm afraid that's where we are, so I thank you very much. Let me, um, we had, we had 10 proposals and you said you're, you know, basically agreeable with most of the seven of them anyway. Um, and I would think rather than being fatalistic or pessimistic like my colleagues uh, on the uh, minority, uh, that we can't do any better, I think we need to do the best job we can. And by having more partnership specialists, which you agree with, is going to help because the partnership specialists are hopefully going to be targeted. I hope, I assume the additional ones be targeted to the Hartford County areas. Is that a good assumption? Sure. I mean, that should help. And we've got to do a full enumeration. The courts have ruled. And we can start going, oh, we need to go back to sampling, go back to sampling, go back to sampling. It's a broken record. The courts have ruled, let's move forward, do the best job we can. Let me go over a few more of the issues. Census in the schools, that's a good program, I think. Now, uh, they start off with only 20% of the schools, mm -hmm. but hopefully there's, you know, I don't know if we can get all the schools, but it's, you know, any idea of how many we, we were going to be able to try to get yet? Or, I mean, or is that still secret um, information? Yeah, no, I did, um, in case the committee hasn't had a chance to see it, we did, of course, press pretest our census in the schools program, and I have these materials if you're interested. Um, the 20% um, the was targeted on the hard to, hard to reach parts of the population, uh, and it was re restricted to 20% for budgetary reasons. Uh, and if we can go to 100%, we would love to go to 100%. We would love to engage every school child in the United States in this civic ceremony. Uh, it would be a, a marvelous thing. And uh, so we're, we would welcome the opportunity to give this, get this into 100% of the schools. Well, if that's possible, I would be very supportive because it is, you know, civics is what it is. And to uh, make it possible, anything we can do, I think I would be supportive and I, I would hope my colleagues would not object to that. Um, the um, AmeriCorps, I understand you're working with AmeriCorps trying to find a way to work out something, is that right? Well, yes, we, in fact, uh, we, have al we had already met with, um, with AmeriCorps, not with the AmeriCorps, but the Corporation for National Service, of course. Okay. AmeriCorps is only one of their right. five, five programs, and we have now worked out with, uh, with uh, Mr. Wolford and his staff uh, a way to cooperate not just with AmeriCorps, but also with the national service sector, um, with the foster grandparent program, uh, <coughs> their retired and senior volunteer program, every, every part. It's one of our most important partnerships. We have, after all, already, after all, already signed up over 10,000 partnerships. Well, that's good. And, and, and we, a lot we, of this will help in the heart of count areas, right? Uh, some oh, of these will be in inner city areas. Is that right? Oh, certainly. So I, I hope my colleagues will not object to helping use that effort, too, since they minimize, minimize uh, the ability. The matching grant program, you said you're just not set up to make it be a grant-making organization. Is there someone else at the Census Bureau that can do that? I mean, I mean, not the Census Bureau, the Commerce Department. The Commerce Department is a huge grant-making organization. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I haven't explored I, with the Commerce Department. Uh, I, you know, I've, after all, I spent 10 years in private foundations. I've had a bit of experience with, with, uh, with grant yeah. programs. Um, and perhaps there's a way you could look to the private foundations. Uh, many of them are quite engaged in the Census. They have bureaucracies. They've got uh, uh, mechanisms to sort of control uh, the quality of, of the grants, monitoring uh, the performance of the people who get grants and so forth. So perhaps you'd like to explore this with the American Foundation community. Uh, it would be a very important partnership between the public and the private sector. We would welcome more money going into our partnerships. You can appreciate why I'm a little hesitant at this late stage to make the Census Bureau into something which, which I know is very difficult for it to be, which is to say a grant a grant making operation because I have had 10 years of experience with that. Uh, so it's not a hesitancy about wanting money in the hands of the partners. It's how is the most effective way to make that happen. Maybe there's a, you know, within the census, I mean, within the Commerce Department, there is a more of an appropriate vehicle that can be handled kind of independent because it, it, it can, it's something that, again, I think we'd all support, especially for the hard to count areas. Let me um, uh, have one uh, final question and go back to uh, Post Census Local Review. This is the relationship to Post Census Local Review and the ACE? issue. Is there any connection between the two of those? The, uh, the, that's the 300,000 sample, does it impact the, because I've heard that, you know, one of the reasons you're opposing it is uh, that it will make it harder to do the uh, sampling adjustment. Is that true? Sure. I, don't, I don't know on what basis that would have been suggested to you. So the post and local review have, has no impact, to your knowledge, on uh, the, uh, sam the 300,000 sampling process, right? No, um, because of the time factor. Is it's, that it's important to know that the um, the accuracy and coverage evaluation is is, a, is an accuracy and coverage evalu evaluation of both addresses and and people. Right. Uh, so I, maybe in some kind of complicated way, but no, uh, we will go back and find out how well we did with our address list, just as we will go back and find out how well That's we did good. with our count. But uh, okay. 
Yeah. Thank you. That's my uh, final question. Anybody else have a, one question? Yes, I do. Um, are, are you aware, Dr. Pruitt, that the advisory committee does not support the post-census local review? They uniformly came out of, in opposition to it? I, I, I believe that what they uh, recommended again was the uh, attempt by a congressional committee to, to legislate it uh, in, in such a way that would sort of interfere with the ongoing procedures of the census itself. So, and uh, are you aware that the post-census local review is scheduled for a markup this week to be reported out and, and to pass, I assume? So I'd just like to ask you, um, GAO came out with a report that was very critical of, of the uh, post-census local review program. And given their findings, I'm sure you read their report and the Bureau's uh, prior experiences, what reasons can you give uh, to hope that the outcome of the post-census review uh, will be any different this time? Um, well, there, there, should be, um, there should be sort of nothing for the local governments to do if they cooperated with us back when we wanted them to cooperate with us, which is to get the address list right. Um, I, I do want to remind you that there's also a, um, a boundary annexation of, a process that we do do late in the fall of 2000, which makes sure that all the boundaries are correct. And we do do that, of course, with the, uh, with the local governments. So it's not as if we're not constantly interacting with the local governments about sort of improving our procedures. Um, I guess I'm just uh, less convinced than the chairman is that sort of giving them the counts and then asking them uh, to sort of say, well, is that as many people as live under these, you know, under these bridges or whatever, to use the metaphor that was used earlier, uh, it strikes me as not a very uh, effective way to go about involving local governments in the census operation, which we have now been doing for, uh, for about eight months. Um, Will it hinder your ability to get the job done? Uh, any new procedure that's not already embedded in what we're trying to put in place today will hinder our job. It just will. And I cannot say that strongly enough. And, uh, and, and this, is not, this is not to say a given idea isn't a good idea, perhaps, but it is, it's very unlikely that it's in a domain that we haven't thought about. We've been doing it, you know, a couple hundred years. Uh, doesn't, we're not perfect. And it's quite possible that there's something out there we haven't even thought of. But the job is not like most people think it is. It is a count, it's 120 million addresses, and it's putting them together on a single day. There's no other operation like it. So people who haven't lived in that operation perhaps don't appreciate what goes into it. I would, I would love it if the members of this subcommittee would come out and sit in that lockup room for an hour or two and watch the process at work. And then you would know how risky it is to sort of say at this late state in the cycle, aha, uh -huh, I've got a better idea. And say, pull this out and put that in. It, it's, it's just, I have to say, Mr. Miller, you, you worried about my administrative uh, um, uh, accomplishments and, 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 and achievements before I got here, and I appreciate the, the basis of that worry. Uh, but I can tell you as a manager that, that it does not make sense to take something of this complexity in this magnitude and start redesigning it at this stage in the process. We are actually on schedule. I'm sorry we don't have the budget for you today, uh, but we are on the schedule that matters. The schedule that matters is April 1, 2000, December 31, 2000, April 1, 2001. We're on that schedule. Nothing that, that uh, we, we, anything that would deviate us from that schedule, the country will pay a price. Uh, and. That's all I can say, and I can say it as strongly as, as you will allow me to say it. I would invite you, members of your staff, to come out to that lockup room and watch it happen uh, and know how intricate it is. It's this sort of stuff, and then it's, it's putting up on the screen, it's, it's pulling down all of the procedures that go into a particular line, all of the subsequent activities that happen because of that line, making sure that everything connects with everything else. That's what it is to put this kind of operation in place. And it's very, very late in the day to imagine that we can do anything other than move forward with it. Well, I would like to respond uh, to your invitation to go to the lockup room and see how it works. I hope uh, my colleagues on the committee will join us. And I hope you would open it up to the public so that we could all see it. <laughs> Maybe we can put it on C-SPAN or <laughs> CNN. 
and let everyone see how changing the census this late in the game will jeopardize being able to come forward with a more accurate count. I thank you, uh, Dr. Pruitt, for your testimony. Mr. Davis, do you have any? No further questions. Um, you know, thank you for the invitation, because we've had a great frustration over the past months or so of a lack of information uh, from the Census Bureau. Now maybe, you know, I guess the openness is, is, is that the staff can go out and maybe you know, see a little bit more what's happening, and, and that, I think, would be good, because um, this secret attitude um, is not building trust when we don't have the numbers. And we need to have a system. We need to also start talking about what's going to happen in 2010 census. How do we avoid this issue of trust we have today? Um, and I look forward when our next time after we get the plans to come back and, uh, and Congress does have a role. And I think if you, you know, to say that Congress is irrelevant, and I know you're not saying exactly that, but you're saying basically, you know, butt out, we're the professionals. It's kind of what you're saying because it's too late for us to get involved. But, you know, read Article I of the Constitution. House Representatives very specifically has the power to direct. And so we want to have the, the best census possible. I think working together we can. So with that, let me say on behalf of the committee, let me thank you again for coming. I, let, I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written open statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for Congresswoman Kay Granger to submit an opening statement if she would like. Um, okay. Thank you. meets tomorrow morning for a debate on a bill authorizing Peace Corps funding with a goal of 10,000 volunteers by the year 2004. Also two airline bills, one dealing with a European noise regulation that could impact engines built in the U.S. The other would increase compensation to families of airline crash victims.